Well, good evening, everyone. Appreciate you coming in and so thankful you didn't get blown away by those heavy winds. They were really up uh, today, but I'm thankful you're here in-house and also those of you joining us on Facebook Live, we're thankful for you as well. Uh, hope you can be with us for services uh, this Sunday, God willing. We'll have Sunday school at 10, worship at 11. May the Lord bless our time together. We have a baptism to celebrate Sunday morning also. And we're still in the series, uh, You Are in Sunday School, and also from the pulpit of uh, being an authentic church. And uh, the world needs to see an authentic church. Amen? Amen. So, God bless you. Thank you for spending time in the Word tonight, and then also uh, in prayer for those of us in-house. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. God, we are so thankful for another uh, precious day of life. Help us, God, as your word teaches us to redeem the time, to recognize the sacredness of time, and may we use it well as your children. Lord, bless our time together this evening. Bless those who have assembled, not only in person, but those also online. And Lord, may your spirit go before us and help us, O oh God, to focus upon you. May you receive our worship tonight, Lord our prayers, and may you make our time in the Word of God fruitful tonight. And we thank you for your Word, how uh, it encourages us, how it trains us, how it teaches us. And so, uh, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, uh, make your Word come alive tonight. And Lord, uh, unite our hearts together as one to focus solely upon you. Lord, we ask that you bless those who are traveling, those who are sick, uh, in our congregation and in our families and among our friends, those who need your touch, O oh God. And we ask that you bless them as only you can. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ and all of his children said together, amen. Brother Brandon, if you will. Good evening. If you would please stand, we'll do our uh, hymn for tonight. It's going to be number 82 in your hymn book. We'll sing all three verses of Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Let's lift it up to him tonight. Guide me, O Thou Great Jehovah,
Well, turn with me, if you will, tonight to Zechariah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. We'll read tonight a shorter version or vision uh, through the eight visions of Zechariah. And this is vision number 6. We're looking specifically, not only briefly, at the eight visions of Zechariah, but applying them to our lives and see how they can still speak to us as the church today. We've seen uh, that these visions have to do specifically uh, with the Jewish people of Judah coming back into the land and rebuilding and restoring worship in Jerusalem again. The visions thus far have been those of encouragement as we all need when we are rebuilding things in our lives, especially when rebuilding our spiritual lives. Well, the sixth vision has to do with some warnings in building back their relationship with their God and striving to walk according to his word again and remaining faithful to the God that was bringing them back into the land of promise and strengthening them to build back after a time of discipline that they had experienced as they had been in captivity for some seven decades. Well... Through the visions, God's reminding them that he would provide for their needs, that he would protect them. But we are also reminded that God uh, lets them know that he wasn't going to continue to bless them if they turned back to idolatry and continued sinful living, ignoring their God and the covenant relationship that they had with their God. Well, it is the same with our relationship with God. God blesses us, and he helps us rebuild broken things in our lives, most assuredly, and especially our worship. However, he won't continue to bless us if we refuse to walk in his ways, living only for wicked pleasures and living only to satisfy our sinful desires. And so they needed at this time and this juncture in their lives to hear these warnings because it was idolatry, wickedness, and allowing many injustices that had caused their brokenness in the first place. And so he warns them of that. Now, I feel that sometimes uh, because we might not as Christians uh, have physical idols in our homes that we're bowing down to that we don't think that we can fall into the traps of idolatry but we most assuredly can and we most assuredly have throughout the centuries if we're not careful we can even have our idols within the church those things that we place more value upon than god's word those things that we protect more than we do uh, god's word and christian integrity it can happen, it has happened, and it does happen, and it is happening in many ways. But they needed to hear these warnings, and we need to be reminded God is loving, He is patient, He is long-suffering, but for those that know the Lord and that are in a relationship with Him, He will not and He cannot allow us to dwell in known and obstinate sin forever. And uh, God has expectations for his people. And his expectations for those that know him, especially under the new covenant of the blood of Christ, by grace and through faith, he has different expectations for us than he does the rest of the world. We need to be reminded of that. He had those expectations for the people of Judah and in Jerusalem. God had expectations for his people that knew him and that had entered into a relationship with him. And that is still true with us today. Those who have tasted his grace and have been given his Holy Spirit cannot expect to willfully and continually live in known sin and pride and experience continued blessings. At some point, uh, those blessings stop and discipline begins. You know, it's true, sheep fall into a muddy ditch from time to time. All of us do, all of us have, all of us will. All sheep will fall into a muddy ditch from time to time, but pigs wallow in the mud. And that's the difference. 
We all fall into sin from time to time, but we are not to willfully live in it forever. And that sin can sometimes be pride as well. We're not to wallow in pride. So the sixth vision given to Zechariah in instructing the people had to do with a flying scroll that measured some 30 feet in length and 15 feet in width. It was an exaggerated scroll. And these proportions were not of a typical scroll in their day, but were more like we might compare to a giant billboard that we're used to seeing for advertisement. And so let's begin reading just these four verses. Again, it's a short vision tonight of Zechariah chapter 5 and beginning in verse 1. And the Bible says, Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a flying scroll. And he said to me, What do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubics and its width 10 cubics. Then he said to me, This is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned, and according to what is on one side, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. And it shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones. Well, the flying scroll communicated some important points for the people of Judah to seriously consider. One, it speaks of the importance of the message, the message on the scroll. This was, again, no ordinary scroll uh, that they were accustomed to. And so the message was important. Secondly, it was a flying scroll, which meant that only God himself had unrolled the scroll. Thirdly, the scroll was laid open for all to read. The message was given. It was revealed. And God was warning them by revealing the scroll to them. God wasn't hiding his expectations that he had for the people. It also means that God was publicly expressing his condemnation of the people's sins and their need for repentance in their lives. And so the message was from God and not from any other human as we see the flying large scroll. The flying scroll was a symbol of divine authority. It wasn't the authority of man. And again, this message wasn't for all of creation. It wasn't but specifically was for the chosen people of God that had experienced God's grace and mercy and for a people that knew the Lord intimately. Again, still, God deals with his people today differently than he does with the world. Yes, in the end, he will judge the world. He will condemn all sin, but still, he has different expectations for those that have been saved by grace and through faith in Jesus Christ. And we need to be reminded of that. And through the voice of Moses, God had warned his chosen people of these things even long before this large scroll was given in the sky. Tonight, again, we read the words of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 15, and where God warned his people about trying to live apart from the God that had brought them out of Egypt and out of slavery and was bringing them into the land of promise. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy 28, beginning in verse 1, And if you live faithfully, obey the voice of the Lord your God, uh, being careful to do all of his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. There's the promise. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Notice the ifs. Verse 3, blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb 
and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Seven is that number of completion. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a people, holy to himself, as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your ground within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 12. The Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land and its season, and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall only go up and not down. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, be careful to do them. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. And then verse 15. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. So God had long before this flying scroll uh, warned his people that before you lies blessings or there lies curses. God had chosen them above all the people of the earth in that day. And he had kept them and he had rescued them time and time again. But these blessings of grace came with expectations. And he warned them that if they would not walk in the ways of the Lord as his chosen people, then they would experience judgment. They would experience uh, famine, uh, military and political defeat. He hit on all of these things in those verses. He spoke of plagues, disasters, and ultimately exile from the land of promise. All of those things happened because of their long period of uh, unbelief, of idolatrous worship, and sinful living, and injustices in the land, and even within the place of worship, and even among the priesthood. So because of their disobedience, they had already experienced all of these things and God had disciplined them. He disciplined them because he loved them, because they were his people and because he wanted them to come back into the land and to know him and to worship him alone. So now the Lord had brought them back into the land to repent and to rebuild. He had once again poured out his love and his grace upon them. But the warnings that he had given to Moses still were in effect under that Mosaic covenant. Well, God still has expectations for the Christian's life today, for you and for me. Uh, yes, we are under a different covenant. We are under the new covenant of grace by the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. We are saved from sin and corruption and eternal death through God's grace and through that faith in his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And we are also kept by God's grace as we are found to be secure in God's righteous right hand. And I believe in that security, but still there are expectations upon those who have experienced God's loving and full grace through Jesus Christ. Prosperity always comes with responsibility. Amen? Prosperity always comes with responsibility. Look at Romans, a New Testament text from the Apostle Paul in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. He asked the question, What shall we say then? 
Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Again, he's speaking to Christians, those who have been saved by God's grace, those who have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, those who have been given the Holy Spirit as a gift, sealed by the Spirit until the day of redemption. But he asks, those of us who have been saved by grace, are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? He says with that bold explanation point, by no means shall we continue in sin. He then says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we who have been saved by God's grace still live for sin? Yes, again, we all like sheep will fall into the ditch and get dirty and filthy from time to time. But we are not as Christians uh, to be like a hog or a pig that wallows in the mud all the time and stays filthy. There is a difference. Uh, There's a different intention there. He goes on to say, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? He's not talking about water baptism here. He's talking about being baptized into the death of the old person and raised in the newness of Christ. He says, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we too might walk in the newness of of life. Once we are saved, we're a different person. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. We are now the temple of God, and we're to walk in the newness of life. Well, back to the flying scroll. The flying scroll of God's Word still warns us today, as it did in the lives of the Jews living in Judah in their days. We're still faced with the decision to experience God's blessings, or curses in this life. Blessings or curses depend upon our faithfulness in obeying God's word and loving the Lord who has saved us with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are to love the Lord. The flying scroll in Zechariah's vision, it represented God's law. Again, in Zechariah chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, And then he said to me, This is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief, and the house of him who swears falsely by my name, and it shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones. The Old Testament word for curse is used to reflect different things. In other words, uh, the Hebrew word can mean different things in different passages, but in this context, it has to do with describing the terms of a covenantal agreement between two parties, especially when one side of the the agreement doesn't hold up their end. And so God had already rescued them and given them the land by his divine hand. But they too needed to hold up their end of the relationship between them and the God who had rescued them. They needed to be faithful to God. Well, in these verses, the angel in this vision specifically pronounced the sentence of guilty for the two crimes he he speaks of in these verses of stealing and swearing falsely or lying. Well, the truth is Judah carried guilt for many sins. And so in this context, these two sins represent their collection of sins. These two sets sins represented their relationship with God, but it also represented their relationship with one another that was within the borders of the promised land. Again, God had different expectations for his people living within the borderland, the land of the promised land and its borders than he did the rest of the world. They had been and were being restored in the land of promise. But still, still the Jews who had temporarily escaped judgment would now receive the rightful suffering. God is patient with his people. We rejoice in that. Oh, I'm thankful for the patience that he has shown me in my life in times of ignorance and foolish decisions. 
But we must understand that even as Christians, uh, he will not allow known and unconfessed sin to continue forever without proper discipline, especially the sin of his people. Zechariah's vision pronounced guilt on the whole land and not just on a select few. And when we willfully and continually sin, we must understand it affects not just one person, but it pollutes a whole congregation. It can, uh, it can make filthy a whole community of believers, especially those who turn a blind eye to the sin of the children of God. It pollutes it. Well, in conclusion to this sixth vision of Zechariah, Zechariah saw the Lord's curse flying throughout the whole land, entering the homes of those who were guilty before God. And the people were being returned to the land to rebuild. And it was a joyous time in many ways, but they needed to be reminded that worship needed to be restored, the temple needed to be rebuilt, but they needed to repent and restore a right and genuine worship with the Lord once again. The Lord's prescribed worship. Beloved, we need to be careful for how we worship the Lord. Isaiah 55 and 11, he reminds them through the prophet Isaiah, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Well, not only does this verse reveal that God's words of salvation and blessings will always come into fruition, but this verse also means that God's word of judgment will also be completely carried out. His word will not return empty. In Psalm 147 and verse 15, he sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. So Zechariah 5 and 4 it ends with the declaration that the houses of the guilty will be destroyed or torn down. Of those who were unrepentant, those who were living in sin, there would be curses upon their house. We again see that all who refuse to acknowledge God's righteousness will taste his judgment. And the whole earth will one day see God's complete glory when the Lord Jesus returns for his bride. Everyone will see his glory then and especially when he returns for his bride, the church. However, we must understand, even as God's redeemed people, those who have tasted his grace, must we must strive to remain obedient and faithful in this life, or we too can experience many curses, and we can lose many wonderful blessings that God has for us. And so this vision was a strong reminder to the people of Judah in their rebuilding to repent and to restore a right worship. And these verses still teach us, us who know the Lord and his grace through Jesus Christ. It teaches us today to be true to the God who has redeemed us from the pit of destruction and despair. It reminds us to live obediently and it reminds us to be faithful to the Lord's word and keep our worship sincere, but also genuine. The worship that God prescribes and describes in his word. We don't just offer up some strange fire uh, that we want to worship this way, but we must worship God as the word teaches us. And so as we come to a close of this study tonight, stay true to the Lord. And to the word that he's revealed to you, and with God's strength and grace, may we be a people that experience his blessings in this life, and not that we experience unneeded curses because of willful disobedience. God's grace, I believe, is the most precious thing that one can experience in this life and in the life to come. But you know what? If we believe that, God's grace is to be treated with great respect and care and reverence with our lives. And so we're not to trample upon God's grace with selfish and sinful living and especially willful sin against his word. 
To sin against the word is to sin against the God who has shown us great mercy. And so may God grant us the grace to live a life worthy of the calling to which we've been saved and called to live. And so, as I was finishing up this uh, lesson uh, for tonight, we must ask ourselves the question, as I've asked myself, If you are living in disobedience tonight in any way, God is faithful, and we rejoice in that, and he's just to forgive us of our sins, and he's able and willing and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are thankful for that tonight. Amen. However, what must be our part? Well, we're to acknowledge our sins quickly. We're to repent of them speedily and to turn back to the Lord with all our hearts. And then the Lord will bless the rebuilding in our lives that need to take place. May God bless you tonight. Let's pray again. God, we thank you for your patience, for your love, for your grace, your mercy, your long-suffering. You are so much better to us than we deserve. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to keep your watchful eye and your steady, righteous right hand upon us tonight to strengthen us, O God, and to keep us close to you, walking with you and beside you in all aspects of our life. Help us, O Lord, to be faithful to you tonight. If there be sins in our life that need to be repented of and that we need to forsake and to turn back to you, Lord, help us to do that with the Holy Spirit and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for being faithful to do that. Lord, be with these tonight who have assembled. Continue to work mightily in their lives and to bless them. And may we experience your blessings, Lord, and help us to steer clear of your warnings tonight and that we may not experience unneeded curses in our life. Have mercy upon us, O God, because we need your mercy each day. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Well, for those of you joining us online, we appreciate you so much for being with us tonight. May God bless the rest of your week. If at all possible, come and be with us in house on Sunday, Sunday school at 10 and worship at 11 o'clock. May God bless the rest of your week. Bye-bye.